next segment, um, Pastor Enoch Lavender. Now, Enoch has a BA in Intercultural Ministry from Harvest Bible College in 2008 and is based at Eastern Chinese Christian Church in Mount Waverley, Melbourne. He's been actively involved in the ministries of Shalom Israel. Actually, he's my right-hand man, to put it bluntly and straight. Uh, being actively involved in the ministries of Shalom Israel and Ebenezer Emergency Fund. He also serves on the board of Teach All Nations, the ministry of Dr. Camille Majdali. He has been studying Hebrew and Hebrew roots for the past six years and has a keen interest in the Middle East from a Bible prophecy perspective. As a self-employed web designer, Enoch has been serving many churches, Christian groups and secular organisations. He speaks at a specialised range of uh, topics, including end times, Israel, the Jewish feasts and intercession. And some of the topics he has covered in the past include the restoration of Israel and the church, the Passover at the time of Jesus, all the Israel four feasts, Hanukkah and God's temple, Alia and the amazing return of the Jews and prophetic intercession. So we're blessed this morning to welcome Enoch as he gives us his lecture on the battle for the Temple Mount. Welcome, Enoch. All right, thank you. Thank you, Pat. It's good to see so many of you here this morning. Thank you all for, for coming. And uh, what a blessing it is to be in praise and worship. Actually, uh, it's been on, on my mum's heart regarding Shalom Israel for some time. She's been praying, Lord, we want worship. We want to worship you. It's not just about information about the Middle East and information about the latest in the, the peace process and the terrorism and, and all that, which is important for us to know. But it is about worshipping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is worthy of our praise. Terrorism is not worthy of our praise. The, the jihadi threat is not worthy of our attention. Our God is worthy of our attention and our praise. And it's important in this time we lift our voice to him. It's important in this time that we do not spend all our time focusing on the evil the enemy is doing. But we focus on the good that God is doing and we worship him. It's amazing as we read the book of Revelation, destruction and turmoil are happening all across the earth. But what is happening in heaven? Worship. They are worshipping God like never before. And God is calling us to worship Him as we are facing increasingly difficult times. Don't turn down your worship. Don't turn off your worship. Turn on your worship to come into the presence of the Lord. It is time to worship Him. Amen. We are talking about the battle for the Temple Mount past present and future. We'll begin in Second Chronicles chapter 7, where Solomon is dedicating the temple that he had built to the Lord. And there is an amazing promise by God himself to Solomon written in our scriptures. Second Chronicles 7 verse 15 says, Now my eyes will be open and my ears Attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. God himself is describing the temple mount, the, the location of the temple. And he is saying that his eyes and his ears will be attentive and be watching what is happening at this place. He is saying that he has chosen this place. Another scripture describes the Temple Mount as the Mount of Appointment, Mount of Moed. Many of you might be familiar with the, the Jewish feasts known as the Moed of the Lord. And the word feast or Moed also means appointment, an appointed time. And the feasts are appointed times symbolizing Jesus' first coming, Jesus' second coming. But the word Moed means more than just an appointed time. It also means an appointed place. And God had an appointed place for his people, an appointed place where he was going to meet with them. And that place is the Temple Mount. And he describes it here as a place he has chosen, he has sanctified, that my name might be there forever. His name. The name in Hebrew re represents the, the character, the essence of who he is. And so God is saying that this place, I'm placing my name placing his stamp of, of ownership on this place, 
showing who he is. And he says that my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. We can be tempted to think that since the temple is no longer standing, that God has sort of moved out of there. We, we met a, a Jewish man when we visited Israel recently, and he heard we were from Australia. And uh, he was very excited about Australia, and, and uh, he, he could tell that we were believers. And he said, well, God is not here in Israel, he said. God is in Australia. <laughs> he said, what? Well, he was explaining that Israel in the Middle East is a God-forsaken place. There's wars, rumors of wars, terror and everything. But Australia seems nice and peaceful. Maybe God has moved to Australia. <laughs> it would be good. It, it, yes, we want God in Australia, but we know that the place of his throne is in Jerusalem. We know that there he is not as far off as they call out to him. So we were challenging him that God is near to you. Where you are in Israel, you need to look to him. Now the Temple Mount, as we have described, the place of the temple, a holy place, is a place where a lot of things are going on today that are really um, provoking the Jewish people and provoking many who see it. Now I've got a picture on the slide here of two young Palestinian men uh, practicing martial arts on the Temple Mount. There are other pictures of playing soccer on the Temple Mount, uh, of um, Arab women, Arab men screaming curses at, at Jews and Christians who go up to pray. This is the only place where Jews and Christians cannot pray. They'll be arrested by the Israeli police themselves, is the Temple Mount. It is astonishing. It is shocking. And as this is coming out more and more recently on the news in Israel, it is provoking a response. And Jewish people who have kind of moved on from the whole idea of having a temple, are now starting to say, hey, this isn't right. Why can't we pray at this place dedicated to our God? Why is these kind of activities going on on a place that is set apart as holy ground, a place where Jewish people will take off their shoes as they go up there because it is a holy place? And yet these kind of activities are going on. There is a battle over the Temple Mount. There's a battle over control of this place. There is a battle of the worship of the Almighty God. Let's get the next slide. We mentioned earlier during the worship Rabbi Yehuda Glick, who has been a promoter of rebuilding the Temple. But he has been taking a very uh, smart tactic. While many Jewish people are not necessarily supportive of building the Temple, he has been promoting the idea of equal rights for prayer on the Temple Mount. And that has really rung a bell, and many have started to get the idea that this is what the way it should be. Now, as Yehuda Glick has stood for this, he has been, from my perspective, a bit compromising. He is saying, let's all pray there, Jews, Muslims, Christians. It's all the same kind of thing. I, I don't agree with him. But for his stand, he was recently... They recently tried to assassinate him. Uh, a man came to him in October, October 29th, after he had spoken at a lecture about the Temple Mount, asked for his name. He said, yes, I am Yehuda Glick. He pulled out a gun and shot him four times in the chest at close range. He was rushed to the Israeli hospitals, and through many surgeries, his life was spared. And he has come out of hospital, and he held a press conference as he came out, praising the God who raises the dead. Truly, he is one who has survived an amazing, amazing uh, ordeal. But it is dangerous. It is dangerous to speak up for the Temple Mount. It inflames passions, both on the Jewish side but also on the Muslim side. They see it as, as a desecration of holy Muslim ground when non-Muslims come close to that area. It's not just about keeping non-Muslims out of the mosque. It is about keeping non-Muslims out of the surrounding area. And so it is seen as a provocation to the, the radical Muslims. For example, bin Laden, when he was alive, he issued a fatwa, uh, a, a statement and a call to jihad against the West. And one of his main reasons was to liberate the temple, the Al-Aqsa Dome and the, the mosques in the area from the, the impure influence of the surrounding peoples. 
It's not enough for, for bin Laden and the likes of him that non-Muslims are kept outside of the Dome of the Rock. They need to keep them outside of the entire area. And as Jews, as Christians start to come close, that is provoking a response in them. It's known as the uh, dynamite keg, the fuse of the explosive Arab-Israeli conflict. Any Israeli action anywhere near the Temple Mount causes riots across the Middle East. There is a great concern in Israel about the potential international backlash of getting anywhere near the Dome of the Rock. Let's get to the next slide. Now, this is the uh, member states of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. There are 56 member states. It was founded in 1969 in response to Israel taking control of East Jerusalem for the first time. The purpose and the stated purpose of this organization is to defend the Al-Aqsa Mosque, to defend uh, the Muslim holy sites in East Jerusalem from uh, criminal Zionist ambitions. The second purpose of this organization is to liberate the lands of Palestine and give it back to the Palestinians. Russia, as we can see here in red, is an honorary member. They are a guest member because they have many Muslims living in Russia. And it is interesting to see this linkage of nations who are together with one purpose and one goal, to defend the Al-Aqsa Mosque, to defend the Temple Mount, to make sure that no activity is done by Israel on this site that would compromise what they see as their, their, their place of worship. With only 40% of Jews today are supporting equal prayer rights on the Temple Mount, and even less are supporting the idea of rebuilding the Temple. It looks very unlikely. I know a, a Bible prophecy teacher who uh, says that, well, he doesn't think it will happen. It's, in a nutshell, it's looking very impossible. Some of us hope that something might just happen that will actually bring it about. A storm, an earthquake, something will happen to, to bring a change. Uh, in the recent Gaza war, rockets were being fired all over Israel from, from Hamas in Gaza. And some were hitting Jerusalem. And um, the Iron Dome, which is the anti-missile defense uh, of Israel, was doing a good job protecting the nation. But a cartoonist had a bright idea. Uh, let's see the next slide. <laughs> He's saying, you dummy, I told you to hit the Iron Dome, not the Golden Dome. Good shot, that's right. <laughs> I believe that the end time signs include the rebuilding of the temple, and I want to share a little bit about this with you. We'll, we'll turn to the book of Amos, which is one of many prophetic scriptures we could use. Many prophets in the Old Testament foresaw a time when the Jewish people would be restored to the land but often they also described a rebuilding of the temple, a, a re restart of worship of God at the Temple Mount in conjunction with the restoration of Israel. So we'll go to Amos chapter 9. A bit hard to find sometimes, these minor prophets. Amos chapter 9. Now, Amos is written before any Jews had ever been sent into exile. He was, he's talking to the northern kingdom of Israel at the time, and he is warning them of impending judgment if they do not repent of their ways. And he lists the, the judgment that is coming, but in verse 11, the prophetic promise comes. It brings hope. You see, when God comes with a warning of judgment, he also comes with a message of hope. And he says in verse 11 that on that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, 